Greeting Cybertronians, sorry to delay the start of the video a bit, but I just want to discuss something ever so quickly. My friend James Wong, who you may have seen on this channel a few times before, is currently working on a webcomic, and it has just entered its crowdfunding phase. I edited a video for said crowdfund, and I tried putting it up to get more people to join, but the YouTube algorithm seems to have buried it into the abyss. So I'm just going to quickly let you guys know that he's got a crowdfund running at the moment. And if you want to read the comic, I've got a link in the description, and if you want to support the crowdfund, I've got a link in the description as well, as well as in the top corner there. Sorry to take up your time, just I really want to see him succeed with this because he's a close friend of mine and uh, I guess that's it. On with the episode! Read the disclaimer! I'm the other one, you bastard! Brought to you by supporters who probably have better taste than this schmuck. Christ, you guys keep asking me and asking me to do Kingdom Rodimus. Every time I post a comparison spot, it's the same damn question. Well, fine! You guys happy now? I guess I'm finally covering- Wait, why are these two f***ers here? <laughs> So you've got your regular cast of characters that typically get made over and over. Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, Megatron, Starscream, Windblade until Hasbro decided apparently she didn't deserve War for Cybertron Engineering. The bastards. But below all those, there are a few who keep coming back. They may not get the same pull as the main four, but they still remain highly recognisable within the community, and they still get plenty of remakes as the years go by. Hot Rod, and by extension Rodimus Prime, falls into this category. Perhaps the reason he didn't reach the same success as the likes of Optimus was due to the fandom's delusions and thinking he was responsible for Prime's death. Come on, G1ers, get a better f joke. And beyond that, the franchise was nearly killed off due to lack of media surrounding G2, horrendous marketing, and Takara jumping ship post movie. Either way, he's definitely not as popular as the mainstays, but he's still a surefire sell in whatever line he's in. So today, I thought it would be neat to take a look at the three most recent entries. Well, the three most recent G1 entries. I don't think putting this guy in the mix would be fair. With that said, greetings Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and welcome back to another Versus review. For today's diagnosis, we're pitting three unique takes on the character against each other. Power of the Primes, Leader Class, Evolution Rodimus Primes, Studio Series 8604, Voyager Class, Hot Rod, and Kingdom Commander Class, WFC, K29, Rodimus Prime. Anywho, I suppose the easiest way to do things is in chronological order. The format of this review may seem a little all over the place at times, since some of these have combined modes whilst others don't, but whatever, I'm sure I'll get my shitty opinions across just fine. So, in base uncombined vehicle mode, Power of the Primes, Roddy transforms into something that's pretty easy to describe. Cheese. I of course mean this in the most endearing of ways. This is a pretty f sweet slab, and probably the best of the three core leader modes of his line, although it's not particularly hard when he's competing with a surfboard and Mr. Oh look at me, my arms transform, right? Either way, I love the angles on this thing. Hot Rod is a design that lends himself to a certain swishness, and this nails it nearly flawlessly. The flat front section walks the line of mean bumper and air slicer, giving an aura of both aerodynamic and powerful feelings. Yes, this was a weird sentence, but it's so good I'm finding it difficult to put into words. I really dig the deep, transparent blue window. It's easily the best of the three, not to say the other two are bad in their shades of aqua, but but this feels far richer. Also love how they properly moulded in the dip at the top, really gives it some definition. And hey, the red on the cockpit is done really well, which is commendable given how it's usually really difficult to get red right. Red and yellow are typically the hardest colours to pull off, after all. Speaking of, yeah, the lights at the front sadly didn't do it that well. In terms of deco, it's the only thing I can really take issue with. Either way, these really could have used an extra coat. It stands out especially heavy when the rest of the figure punches forward with this lovely shade of bright red. When the rest of it looks this vibrant, these don't seem to be pulling their weight. Still, the silver certainly is, yes, these are a little blockier than than you're normally used to, but they bring some much needed pizzazz to the sides of the car. Not that you need that given this f***ing awesome spoiler here. I love how prominent it is, and the detail on the whole is radical as f that said, not too big of a fan of the plastic choice here. You kind of get what I like to call Siege Optimus Prime Syndrome, as that was the first time I noticed it on the figure. Essentially, the plastic has a soft quality to it, and when combined with the pigment, it makes the detail very hard to see from a distance. There's a lot of lovely lines on the thing, but it sadly gets lost in all of this. It's really fighting hard against the positive qualities of the alt mode, along with a few other issues such as the sudden dip in the midsections on the side. The other two have pretty consistent profiles, but due to the transformation to both robot and combined modes, it's a small sacrifice that had to be made. Still, I'll take it over visible arms any day. And last but not least, the flame pattern on the bonnet ain't the best. It isn't bad by any means, but it seems a little unfocused. Now to be fair, this is an issue that affects most Rodomai on the market. In fact, prior to this version, the only modern Rodimus that did it properly, at least as far as I can remember, was the Combiner Wars version. I'm sure there's a Takara edition or some weird obscure rare thinger or a masterpiece that I'm forgetting about, but the point is it's hard to get Rodimus's paint right, so I understand why it fails. I internalise no delusions. This mould has issues. For some people, they may not be able to overlook it, but for me, the few good points it has really outclass every 
everything else. The profile is phenomenal. The silhouette is stunning. The paint, where it is applied, is applied crisply. The size is appropriate. Basically, you get a slightly smaller than Voyager affair with a bunch of extras, which we'll get to. In fact, Power of the Prize was the pioneer of such things, and I really do respect that. Truth be told, most of Pot Pie was complete and utter dog sh**. I know it's become a bit of a dead meme for me to sh** on Earthrise, but Jesus Christ, it could have been a lot worse. The leaders, though? Honestly, I think they were the shining light amongst the sh**. Either way, point is, this is a f brilliant alt mode. In fact, out of all three versions being tackled here, I think this embodies Hot Rod's personality the greatest. And sure, the Kingdom version is purely trying to be a Rodimus Prime, so it doesn't really have to compete. But compare him with the SS86, and in my mind, there's no contest. The Cheese Slab of Death takes the cake super f easily. So if that's the case, what exactly went wrong with the SS86 version? Well, right off the bat, he's not a bad alternate mode by any means. If taken at face value, it seems like the most mature of the three, with a clear aesthetic that it works towards through supposedly classy engineering and obviously high paint budgets. They've clearly taken a lot more inspiration from the screen model, given that this is a Studio Series 86 figure. Hell, the only ones that don't go for the extreme accuracy in the line are the Dinobots. The thing is, everything ends up being nearly there. It almost hits the mark, but it never quite nails anything. Take the front, for instance. They've definitely put a sh** ton of effort into this this thing with plenty of orange and yellow paint working to bring the bonnet to life. The overall shape is definitely a step up from the Pooty Pram version, as is the decision to use orange headlights. They also painted the window frames this time, which is pretty damn neat, and I think the profile of the spoiler works a lot better too. It's got a more angular silhouette, and manages to stick out a lot better. I also love how they've incorporated the profile of the arms on the side of the car. Seriously, this is some clean shit right here. This is of course possible by shoving a Voyager price point into a deluxe sized transformer. And I'm aware there are still naysayers of this concept, but for fuck's sake, get over it. Astro train came out two years ago, we've been over this countless times already. This price point allows a lot of extra goodness to be shoved in, such as an improved paint job on the exhaust pipes. You just know that at a deluxe budget, these would have been painted halfway and then left for customizers to fill in the blanks. Also, massive kudos to the angles on this thing. They do a really amazing job with the subtle upward sloping. So, the figure does a lot amazingly, right? Must be fantastic, eh? Well, let's go over these points one by one. Starting at the front, they've added in this sharp angle to mimic the cartoon, right? Well, honestly, I feel it's perhaps a little too sharp. I'm not just taking this from an accuracy perspective, mind you. I'm just judging the aesthetic as its own thing. The way I see it, it fits right in the uncanny zone between deliberately sharp and subtly obtuse. It doesn't quite commit to either side of the fence, and as such, it just kind of looks weird. By technicality, it's not even accurate to the cartoon model either. Then you get the flames, and yes, they are better than what came before, but they still aren't that great. For all my complaints with the prior figures in this line, I can at least acknowledge that the decos were f spot on. This just doesn't hit that mark. It seems too wavy, more like octopus tentacles than proper flames. And the funny thing is you can't use the well it's accurate to the source material excuse since I combed the footage from the movie for comparisons and well it's not. These flames are close but not quite there along with the aforementioned angles here. I'm not one to obsess with hypertune accuracy in my action figures but if that's the reason people use to explain why it looks this way I'm sorry that argument just doesn't hold up. I will say though the frames definitely are accurate but uh, why weren't these molded in? If they were going to put these in the first place, why do they resort to a boring flat piece of plastic? It makes it look closer to a Repro Labels upgrade set than an actual design choice. Christ, even the Pootis Pensa version did that right. Also, Jesus, this is some bad colour matching at the front here. Usually stuff like this doesn't bother me, but for some reason this kinda pisses me off. And hell, not even the lights get the paint right. They have the same washed out effect as the Power of the Primes one. Sure, they look a little better, but orange paint isn't as hard to do as red or yellow. Why are these like this? Then you've got the spoiler, which ends up with exactly the same fuzziness as its predecessor. One step forward half a step back. Oh, and whilst on the topic, the rest of the figure also ends up looking fuzzy. There's a reasonable dosage of mechanical detail all over, nothing too elaborate, it's just satisfactory. Unfortunately, it's really hard to see any of it. The exhaust pipes, well, these are actually perfectly fine, but the arm profile, whilst better overall, ends up looking scraggy with all the joints and extra pieces. The damn thing doesn't even hold together well. Yes, there were gaps in the previous version, but surprisingly not as noticeable as this. And as for the overall profile, why is he curved? Again, don't bring up the tune accuracy as an excuse. Yes, there was curvature to the design, but but not to this level. And again, I have to clarify, I don't think this is a bad figure, it's just that I can see what they were trying to do and it doesn't reach the mark. They clearly had a checklist for things the screen model was well known for, but it feels like there was a lack of experience in pulling it off properly, something which was present with a lot of SS86 designs. Plus beyond that, taking the design in a vacuum as a toy, there's a lack of concrete tissue that brings the whole thing together. It just feels like a bunch of unconnected ideas that fumble around aimlessly. The Porky of the Pig version was definitely a simpler package with more sacrifices made, but when it was good, it was f***. 
and good. This just doesn't have many high points to balance out the meh. Again, not bad, but not particularly great either. And that leads us to the final contender, who's a very different beast. The other two are going for swishness, thanks to the hot rod DNA injected into their cheesy veins. But this guy is going for that primely chunk, and hot damn, they did a fantastic job here. The first thing you'll notice is that this is easily the most greebled of the three, fitting right into the War for Cybertron aesthetic, specifically on the Siege side of things. Admittedly, I do prefer this sort of style, but even putting aside my biases for a bit, I reckon this does a better job of getting its aesthetic across than either of the two previous editions. Nowhere is that more obvious than the spoiler, which f me looks stunning. To work around the detail potentially getting lost in the plastic, this was all done in paint, and holy shit does it do wonders for the line work. This looks like it came straight out of an Oda King video, in all the right ways. I also dig the vent detail placed right below it. You can sort of see similar indents on the previous two, but here the designers have taken it in a completely unique direction. It probably would have looked silly on both aforementioned revisions, but here, given they're going for a beefier design, it does wonders. And sure, this is made of clear plastic, which may cause some concern amongst those with terrible quality control luck. However, from what I can tell, this is the heavy duty stuff that shouldn't break over time. No Earthrise Datsun knee bullshit here, just good old classic solid transparent plastic applied nice and thickly and in ways that don't stress anything. This leads us to the damn nice cockpit, which actually has a lot of mechanical detail hidden under it. You'll never notice it from a distance, but hey, it's there. The designers put a lot of care into this thing. Moving forward, yep, they finally got the flames right, just nice simple curvature, nothing crazy. Of course the outline helps, but even if they had omitted this, it would have turned out great. I'm still glad they included it though. And look, the headlights are actually painted properly, man, they finally got it right. Also, you can see they've got a nice subtle point at the front. Granted, it's definitely more subtle than the cartoon, taking more cues from the toy, but I dig it. Now, from the side, it's a bit of a weird situation. Conceptually, it should be a messier affair than the SS86 attempt, with more bits clashing and far more exposed hinges. In practice, though, the greebling helps cover it up splendidly. And oh, mama, look at those pipes. These are f brilliant. Even the hinges get painted. Talk about attention to detail. If I had to stretch for flaws, I'd say actually no, I'm not really stretching since it's pretty obvious. The red paint on the windshield has a tendency to chip. This is pretty annoying, and I know it may turn a few people off this figure, but for me, this alt mode is near perfect. It feels like a labor of love, and coming from the way John Warden talks about his work on it, that was the intent. Bringing this character to life in the way he knew best. It's well-sized, fantastically detailed, beautifully painted, and comes with a damn fine profile. But ultimately, none of those remain as significant as one key design choice, one shared with the printers of the Tupac version. These two were designed with the transformation in mind, working around it to deliver the best with what they had. SS86 Hot Rod functions on a completely different ideology. They take the screen model and try to recreate it one to one. Honestly, at the Voyager price point, I don't really think this is possible. Perhaps if they had given Hot Rod a leader price point and made him a Voyager, they could have properly done the idea justice, just as many modern masterpiece figures do. Hell, I'll be honest, I'm not even sure Hypertune accuracy is entirely possible in mainline releases to begin with. Maybe Masterpiece is the only price range that can pull it off. Either way though, one thing stands. Goodbye Pork Pie Hat and Kingdom managed to succeed in what they set out to do. Studio Series 86 does not. It took a long time and a lot of close inspection to come to this conclusion, and I think finally receiving the Kingdom version put that into perspective. Of course, that's not all these fellas can do. Well, it is for the SS86 version, aside from some weapon pegging, which I won't show because apparently it can permanently break the plastic. I've heard of several cases where this has happened, so don't do this. Bad idea. But that aside, both the, uh... I'm out of Power of the Primes jokes, so I'll just leave it at that. Both the Power of the Primes and Kingdom editions come with trailers, and the end result is very different than what you'd expect. But first, to plug it into the older fella, some slight transformation is required. This is why the exhaust pipes are a little shorter than the other two versions, although I personally don't mind. Unfortunately, doing so requires a little bit of plastic bending since they didn't quite calculate the clearances properly, but it's not too difficult to work around. And the end result is actually f***ing brilliant. This right here is what initially sold me on the whole design. This edition was my gateway into loving this figure overall. Admittedly, it is a little messy in areas, but on the all it does one undisputable thing, complements the base vehicle mode insanely well. As you slowly move around, you will see slight blemishes. The forearms are clearly visible at the top, along with the hands, and there's a giant hole on the side of it. But they managed to get around this with a few key design choices. The piercing orange on the side does wonders, really bringing out the mechanical detail. It also draws your attention fairly concisely to the pipes on the front, which flow incredibly well despite being two separate pieces. I love how they never stop and continue almost flawlessly. It really allows the car to feel like a proper part of the trailer as opposed to a half-baked Winnebago. Fun fact, it's also Minicon compatible, oddly enough. No idea why, but hey, it's a thing. Probably an accident, though. What's definitely intentional is the weapon storage, which works adequately. I don't really have anything to say about this, it's just simple weapon storage. In fact, I don't particularly have much to say about this, because it's about the same as any other trailer on the market. It takes a damn fine base figure and pushes it to the next level. It does what a trailer is supposed to do, improves what's already there. That said, there's one glaring issue that could ruin it for many people. I think most people have already guessed what it is, but in case you weren't around the fandom a few years ago, in 2016, Time's Return hit store shelves, and with 
it came quite a controversial decision. For some bullshit reason, all voyagers and leaders had extensive use of stickers instead of paint applications. This was bad, on multiple levels. For starters, the sticker quality was rubbish. Whoever bought a G1 reissue from the Platinum line, boom, that's how bad they were. Secondly, unlike some of the examples in the Thrilling 30 line, these were factory applied. Taking into account Shoddy Prime Wars trilogy quality control, this was a terrible idea. They ended up being applied with the accuracy of a drunk horoscope writer. This decision was so bad that it actively drove some fans away from the community, along with other poor design decisions at the time. It's no coincidence that third party had a boom around this period. And it's not like high quality stickers don't exist. Take a look at figures like Generation Select's Grease Pits. These things are beefy as f***. But maybe that's too recent an example. Let's take a look at Thrilling 30 instead. Nice clear stickers, not factory applied, wonderful. Sure, these were a little small, but there's no reason why they couldn't do these again, only bigger. Actually saying that, the moment after I finished this script, Hasbro went and finally announced Toy Color Selects Galvatron, and look, sticker sheet, nice and easy. In fact, it's probably cheaper since you don't have to pay a factory worker to apply them. When examining this toy specifically though, some concessions can be made. These are probably one of the better examples out of the line. Most Rodomai had their stickers applied pretty precisely. Unfortunately, over the years, these stickers have not held up well. So so yeah, I might have to swap out for repro labels at some point. Does that make me hate the figure though? Absolutely not. It's a minor blemish on an otherwise brilliant combination. Much like the core vehicle mode, it has its issues, but there are a few key positive elements that when placed together, massively outshine them. And beyond that, it's just fun to mess with. It rolls well, is decently sized, and appropriately weighted. It doesn't feel light and cheap, which was the problem with a few other leaders at the time. Overall, it's a cracking package. It's so good that back in the day I was considering doing a versus review of this guy and Carrie. Obviously that would have been a terrible idea, but in my defense it was four years ago, back when I was a f***ing idiot. Well, I still am, but either way, fortunately that idea never came to fruition because it didn't work. Glad it didn't go through with it though. Comparing MP to Chug is incredibly reductive. And even if by default Carrie may be the best dollar value since all of his budget goes into one specific figure. Oh, spoilers, maybe. That said, there's plenty of room to improve on this. A few tweaks to the design, a few fillers here and there, and hey presto, you've got a perfect trailer. So, how the hell did they f*** it up? Combining the two elements on the Kingdom version is simple. Perhaps too simple, because this looks unfinished. All the basic ingredients are here, with a nice chunky outline and plenty of paint. Seriously, I think the paint on this thing outshines even the core robot mode, especially these flames. They've even got subtle molding to help differentiate the black. Move over carry, your flames have been dethroned. The paint on the top is wonderful too, using lovely molding to split it up. And I love how they've kept those cool trapezoids, they were my favourite part of carry. Yes, it was a thing on the original toy, but I love how prominent it is here. So, all's fine and peachy, right? Well, for starters, why does the car sit so far out? You take a look at any other Rodomai on the market, and you'll see the window starts firmly below the chassis. This doesn't do that, and as a result, these two just don't gel together at all. It probably isn't helped by the lack of detail on the trailer though. The sculpting isn't bad here, but it clashes with how extensive it is on the main body. There are moments where it reaches that level, but on a design like this, there needs to be more. None of that compares to the most glaring issue though. These pipes stink! Why the actual f do they have this awful gap here? Couldn't they have just hinged them further up the body? This is one of those things that should have been fixed at the design process, where someone should have said it was a bad idea. And all of this for what purpose? So they could have spring-loaded connections that don't even tab in? All this for a dumb gimmick that doesn't improve it that much. Come on, mate. Rodimus himself is doing so much work to make this set worth it. And this trailer just drags the whole thing behind. So this really puts a spanner in the works with which is the best vehicle mode of the three. Of course, let's keep the SS86 one out of this because we've established it isn't in the running here. That leaves two contestants. In base car mode, the competition is pretty close, but I think I have to give it to the Kingdom version. The sacrifices do make sense with the Power of the Primes one, and I do prefer the profile, but there's just so much love and care put into the Kingdom release that I think it edges out ever so slightly. But then you get to the trailer, and well, I think the results are switched. Power of the Primes takes the win here. Don't get me wrong, this trailer isn't bad. Just much like SS86 car mode, it isn't very good either. I mean, sure, it's definitely bigger thanks to the price point, but that doesn't necessarily make it better. So that's one point for each, leaving both tied for first place, and SS86 coming last. I know this might might be a controversial opinion, but honestly, that's the way I see it. And if you hate controversy, well, abandon all hope ye who enter, because things are about to get even more contrarian. So an interesting thing we can see between these three is that there's an evolution as we go on. This starts out with some simple ideas taken from the G1 toy, then this builds upon it, then this basically copies that but does it way better. Of course, you want to talk about the simplest of the three? Well, that's the Power of the Primes one. It is dead simple, and it has to be. It's a combiner. Combiners have to be dead simple. First thing you want to do is untab these sides here. Then they lock in with these double hinges into the tops there, come to the bottom and unhook the arms and they're on sort of hinges and ball joints which allow them to move down a bit. You want to take the feet at the back and slowly arc them down so that they unhook from the two tabs. There's a tab there and a tab there, same on the other side. So you sort of arc them down so they transform properly. Now ignore all of these hinges there, that's for the combined mode. What you want to do is just bring it up a little bit, rotate it around 180 degrees. Then you've got a tab there and a slot there and the whole thing just clicks together. Come to the legs and open up the calves which will allow 
allow you to bring out the feet and close up the calves. Nice and simple, done deal. Last but not least, bring down the chest like that. Pull this section up a bit, which will allow you to rotate it around, and then you lock it into place by pushing it down again. And then the chest pushes back into place, and we have Rodimus. Of course, if you want to access articulation, you will need to unhook the elbows like that. They are locked in with the tab there. But all in all, it's a very simple transformation, almost deluxe level. But as I said earlier, it's for a purpose. It's for the combined mode. You give a combiner way too complex engineering, and it's just going to crumble under its own weight. We've seen that with Devil Savior. It's a terrible idea. Combiners have to be nice and simple, and this does that perfectly. Of course, the Studio Series 86 version does a lot of the same things that this guy does, just through a modernized filter. Or at least it tries. I'm not exactly sure it succeeds. In all, it just feels clunky. Everything should hypothetically work, but due to tolerance issues, it flat out doesn't. First thing you want to do is take the bonnet and move it up a bit. That'll give you enough room to push these things in, although they do have a tendency to fall off at random. And then just leave that open because we're going to do some more stuff with it later. This will allow you to untab the arms, although you can't really pull them out yet. So for now, just move them forward on these really tight shoulder joints that feel like they're going to break. I hate these. Much like the Power of the Primes version, these things kind of clip out, although you don't have to move them down in an arc this time. They just click out like that. Bring up the backpack here, and it will untab from all of this nonsense in the waist here. And this is my least favorite part of the transformation. You come to the bottom and unhook these, and then try to get it around like that. Then you bring up the foot, then you fold in the wheel, and fold in this whole section. There's some great ideas here, but it just isn't executed very well. It works a bit better with the second leg, but these legs are very similar to Fan's Hobby Minerva, meaning because they rotate inwards, they end up clashing with everything, and it just makes the whole experience not fun. Now these panels here, they are f fantastic. Probably the best part of the whole figure. That is fantastic kibble management, but just getting to that point isn't fun. Of course, the waist rotates 180 degrees. Then you bring this whole section out on that hinge there, which is why we didn't deal with the backpack part there yet. And this section rotates separately, rotates around 180 degrees, rotates inwards. You bring up the head, then you rotate that in on itself and rotate the whole thing together and clip it into place. Again, it should be fun. It's a really clever transfer that even mimics the screen model. But thanks to the tolerances, it's just not fun. Anywho, you move the backpack around and peg it into place. And I guess the arms are pretty neat because what you want to do is fold up this tab, rotate around 180 degrees, and then the tab will clip into what looks like a 5mm port, but is actually just a nice, neat housing for it. So these parts in the arms are quite fun. But the figure as a whole just isn't. It's not fun to transform. A lot of steps do feel really clever, but ultimately pointless, like especially what happens in the chest here. It's really clever, but not a lot of it it seems necessary. It's about as pointless as Niantic releasing the new Transformers AR game in Australia early, right before the country goes into state-mandated lockdown. The only reason they did all that chest stuff isn't to be fun, it's just to match the screen model. And as such, they don't really put an emphasis on the tolerances or the play factor, and as such, it's not fun. It's screen accurate, but not fun. And honestly, you can do both, but they didn't here. And that's why I don't like this transformation. So what do you say we take a lot of those ideas with the Studio Series 86 version and recontextualize them? Kingdom Rodimus does a lot of the same things. A lot of the transformation steps are almost identical, but they don't feel identical. They feel clicky. They feel crisp. They feel intentional. It's all about how you implement the ideas, and this figure does that extremely well. Although the larger size does help, so the parts do feel more satisfying. First thing you want to do is come to the side here and open up these panels, and they will clip in on themselves there. la di -de do da Then this whole section will fold up like that, and we'll deal with it later. Untab that from there. Just kind of wiggle these out a bit so they untab from the arms. Come around to the bottom and open up these panels. This is the only clashing that gets done because these do not fold in on themselves. They actually use a triple hinge system while a double hinge system attached to a double jointed knee. Nice and simple. No parts clashing against each other. Wonderful. The wheels push in on each other like so. They then use this double hinged joint to push into the knee like so. Make sure you use the double hinge otherwise you'll end up stressing the plastic and we don't want to do that. So you end up doing it nice and smoothly although it's a bit more difficult on camera. Then you wrap these legs around the backs like so, nice and clean. Not as clean as the SS86 version, but definitely more satisfying. Open up the feet like so, ba da ba. And then this is where things start getting really fun. Come to the bottom here and bring these sections out. They'll be tabbed into those slots there. That will allow you to bring the torso all the way up, or should I say all the way down, so that we can bring this backpack as far back as possible and give us enough clearance to do the torso swivel. Except here it's not linked to a bunch of stupid extra joints you're never going to use, so it actually makes sense. And it actually brings everything to the 
the front. Now at the bottom here, you're going to want to push these sections in, and these also have a tendency to fall off, just like the SS86 version. But if you're careful, it's fine. You've got triple hinges. One, two, three. It's a bit annoying, but the first joint goes in, and the double joints kind of wrap around it, and they clip in like that. Uh, it's a bit hard to show on camera, but you kind of end up with them clicked in like so. After that's done, you want to bring this in, and you want to push it down, which will actually clip it in place. Come on. Come on, come on. Always works off camera, but it never works on camera. There we go. Nice and clicking into place. And of course, if you haven't already, that just folds in there. You've got a backpack joint, which clips in there, which separates the clear plastic so it doesn't get brittle and they just click together. And much like the SS86 version, the backpack rotates 180 degrees and pegs into place. You've got the tab there, slot there, done deal. Now this is really cool. You want to kind of move around the tire until this section opens up like that. You can then push the tire into the shoulder like so, just as you would with the tire on the legs and then you've got a tab there and a slot there and it all clips together that is super clever a nice way to kind of clean up the shoulders without doing anything too crazy it's really fun yank the elbow down so we get a nice bit of extra space and then you do the exact same panel thing as you did with the ss86 version where you open up and rotate around except this one as you fold that in it then pops up a bit extra and then wraps around even further into the arm like so with these big clunky parts it feels far more purposeful so it feels far more satisfying of course rotate the waist as well, although I kind of forgot that he had to do that before the backpack, but you get the idea. That's kind of the whole idea of the figure. It's satisfying. It's clicky. It's strong. Every piece feels intentional. And it's addicting. It feels like a nice, solid, leader-class transformation with a bit of extra budget. It's the same kind of transformation you'd find on Astro Train or Galvatron, where everything's like, whoa! That's how they did that. So it's interesting to see how these two share very similar transformations, but this builds upon that. This takes everything that didn't work with this and does amazing things with it. So ultimately, in terms of who wins the transformation, although I do kind of like the Power of the Primes version, it's functional, it does what it's set out to do, this is the most fun. This is the all-out winner, hands down, no contest. This thing, I don't really want to transform again, come on, fall over for the sake of comedic effect. There we go. Now you see why Rodimus had to be a commander, because they had to give him that extra budget, because they did amazing things with it, and honestly, I'm glad they did. Would I have preferred Magna Boss or Tidal Wave? Yeah, definitely, but... Rodimus has a brilliant transformation, so kudos. Now, oddly enough, I've seen a little pushback when searching around for other people comparing any of these guys together, because some folks seem to have the idea that Hot Rod and Rodimus Prime are two completely different entities. The way I see it, aside from black calves and a sterner face, there's no f difference. You wanna see how Mech Fans Toys pulls off their conversion? You're done! So yeah, I'm expecting a lot of people to call this comparison ludicrous, but honestly, f*** it, I'll do what I do. Starting off with good old evolution, Hot Rod, yeah, this is where the figure starts to show its age. It's not the cleanest robot, with clunky elements aplenty and definite weird proportions. There are things to like, though. For starters, I think this is easily the best head sculpt of the three. It's well-defined, whilst still keeping the aesthetic of pre-prime Roddy. It's also far better than any of the others, with the wonderful choice to include grey instead of silver. Really brings out his chin well. The eyes are done really well, too. They've gone for the visibility of the SS86 one, but the Colors of the Kingdom version. It's a lovely middle ground. I also really like the flames here. The shape actually works quite well, which is surprising given the vehicle mode. Even the stickers are done surprisingly well. In fact, I'd say they're applied the best here out of any mode. Bit annoyed that the shoulder ones are a smidge lopsided, though. Seriously, a sticker sheet would have solved this so easily. What's not so easy to solve is the lopsided Autobot symbol, though. This one affects every copy, but come on, talk about sloppy. Such isn't as noticeable as the proportional issues, though. Seriously, this guy is pretty wonky. The arms are ever so slightly too long, coming in at halfway down the thighs instead of a third of the way. This is amplified by the extending kibble behind it, and those are both amplified with how thin they are. It's an unholy trilogy of visual fuckery, and it really doesn't work with the aesthetic. Neither of these are as bad as the torso, though. The chest looks like a cross between a bib and a set of overalls, being simultaneously too long and too flat. And it all just leads to an experience that's only half of the way there, one that's not mediocre per se, but definitely compromised in many aspects. However, this all makes sense given he is essentially a triple changer. No, I don't count the trailer edition as two separate modes, don't kid yourself. But yes, this is a triple changer from four years ago. Sure, you might compare this to modern triple changes, but that would be doing this fella dirty. Taking ones from around the same time, you can see that one mode always remains compromised. Unfortunately, in the case of Hot Rod here, that mode was the robot mode. Even the articulation suffers from the limits of the transformation. The upper body gets stuck with a few drawbacks, like the inclusion of ball-jointed elbows instead of universal ones, but the real limitations start below the waist. The hips are massively limited, and the knees are ruddy pathetic. Yes, from a modern perspective, it's annoying, but given everything this mold has to do, I don't think I can be too harsh on it. And hey, if you're still interested as using it as a stand-in for your
your movie shelf, the size should work well enough. It's definitely a compromised mode, but it's still quite fun. And through the head sculpt, it still has the personality you'd want. The only thing I change is the weapons. See, with Prime and, uh, Prime, they took a page out of Superion's book and gave them two combining guns. Fortunately, the separator weapons are slightly better than Optimus's here, but still, it's two halves of a gun. Not that great. Still, overall, not bad. Definitely some really nice sculpting on the go, and it helps accentuate the limited posing options he has. Pretty fun package, all things considered. That said, if you're going for a primarily display-oriented collection, it's not going to fit in. That was the primary draw of the Studio Series 86 version when it first came out, and with the robot mode, you can definitely see where the designer's priorities lay. This is one stylish robot mode. Seriously, from a visual perspective, it nails nearly everything. Like, take a look how clean everything folds up. I'm by no means someone who hates backpack kibble, but hot damn, they did a good job here. The proportions are also ruddy, or should I say, roddy perfect. Just the right amount of swishness without feeling too lanky. The chest manages to pull off the flat look whilst still adding a few extra bits of layering to it. It's lovely to see the magenta midriff peeking out, and the orange lights really sell you on the aesthetic. Also better painted than the vehicle mode for some reason. On my copy, the Autobot symbol is slightly off-center, but nowhere near as bad as his predecessor. And in this mode, the flames actually work really well. Granted, this is all due to the chest being a faux part, but I've never really considered faux parts to be an issue with Transformers Engineering, even though I do prefer it when parts are real. The arms have a wonderful amount of detail to them, and the breakup from the wheels on the orange strip does wonders. I guess I could complain about the pipes being circumcised, but it's such a minor thing. It's fine, who cares? Also really nice that they did the Optimus Prime thing and included articulated fingers. It's really cool that they used the increased budget to the figure's advantage. In fact, that's not all they used the budget for, because like many size class in disguise figures, the accessory count is pretty respectable. Of course you've got his two guns, with slightly different moulding for a nice extra touch, and these work pretty well to accentuate the posing. They're also blast effect compatible, but don't worry, you need not bring your own because this set includes some. These are actually some of my favourites out of the effects Hasbro have put out, along with those belonging to Singe and Rung. They're so versatile, and I love how they look just enough like fire without being super specific, like one of the previous Hot Rods we got. You also get a blast effect for the Matrix, which brings me to the fact that he comes with the same Matrix as Optimus Prime. Honestly, I dig this consistency, it makes the franchise seem like part of a greater whole. Of course, there's shit with the Matrix I need to discuss later, but for now, one of his gimmicks is being able to swap out his hands. One of them turns into that thinger from the movie, you know the one, and the other one becomes a 5mm peg so you can engage with the parts formers from the War for Cybertron trilogy. Okay, not really, it's actually for the included pizza cutter, which plugs on nice and simply. Easy to use, wonderful sculpting to mimic the speed of the thing, and decent posability thanks to the use of the peg. Looks like they did a bang up job. I do wonder what these tabs are for though, they seem out of place. Ah oh, well, capping off the robot mode, the legs have probably the best mechanical detail on the whole damn thing. The rest is a decent amount, but the calves are where they really go all out. Doesn't quite reach the same level as the Kingdom version, but hey, nice touch. So on paper, this is a fantastic robot mode, right? Well, it definitely overtakes its predecessor, but for a fairly recent figure, there are a lot of things here that seems like they've taken two steps forward, one step back. Take the articulation, for instance. It's got pretty much all you'd expect from a modern War for Cybertron figure, with all the extra bells and whistles that a figure going beyond its price point can have. Even the articulation of a butterfly joint is neat. In theory. In practice, there are a lot of weird decisions being made here. For starters, the outward shoulder movement locks itself into a certain point, meaning you can't get the subtle outward shoulders that the others have. You can remedy this by swapping them around through the butterfly joint, but then he just looks weird with how high the shoulders are. Secondly, the thighs, and especially the shoulders, are way too tight. With the latter, the joints are so small that I'm afraid I'm gonna break the damn thing. I could let this slide if it were a deluxe or even a Voyager trying to do a traditional size, but given that they're using the deluxe size at a Voyager price point, this kind of stuff should be perfect. Then we get to the butterfly joints, and aside from making the transformation confusing, they just don't work. The chest is far too bulky, and these things don't allow enough clearance for it to get any motion. If this is the end result, why incorporate butterfly joints? If an extra bit of articulation isn't even going to work, then what's the point? Then on the visual side of things, the head sculpt is just fine. The face doesn't have much personality to it. It's not bad by any means, but with those dead eyes, I just can't get invested in the design. And sure, he does come with a damn lovely visor, which helps, but he still looks disinterested with the world around him. Still not as bad as the underpants, though. Where's the paint on this stuff? It ends up looking like he's wearing a magenta diaper, and on a figure this premium, that's not okay. But by far the most frustrating decision, at least on a personal level, is the Matrix compatibility. Get this, there is no Matrix chamber. What the f***? The only reason he has a Matrix is so that he can recreate that one scene in the film, which I get given the backdrop he comes with, but if you're not going to include a cavity in the chest, why the f*** would you bother? Now, this would usually be the point where Vaughn would butt in and start explaining that this is Hot Rod, not Rodimus Prime, so he's not supposed to have the Matrix chamber, but he's currently on the run from the Federal Police for obvious reasons. So I'll answer the argument he would have made in his stead. Take a look at the Dinobots. These guys aren't straight recreations of the Toon model. They're a nice blend of Toon silhouette and toy detail, minus the clear plastic. Then you have Jazz. Uh, unreprolabeled Jazz. The cartoon model of this 
this alt mode is vastly different from what they released with the final product. Even Hot Rod here has made some sacrifices in his vehicle mode to make the transformation work, even if said sacrifices made the vehicle mode end up looking pretty underwhelming. If they were willing to make concessions on these things, what's stopping them from doing so here? And I know it's dumb to try and use third party as an example, but bringing up mech fans toys again, if they can get a Matrix to fit into the chest at half the size with no issue, what's stopping these guys? Well, the way I see it, two potential reasons. The first is just lack of ambition. There was no need to, so why bother? That kind of ambition is what separates the Dinobots, as well as the War for Cybertron trilogy, from the rest of Studio Series 86. They just haven't put their best foot forward, and it really shows. The second is a marketing tactic, giving people another reason to buy Rodimus instead. One has all the accessories, the other has the Matrix compatibility. If this is the case, f unbelievable. It's almost at the level of Nintendo adding a new feature to Skywarp Sword, then locking it behind an amiibo. Of course, this is all dealing in hypotheticals. We'll never know the true reason why they chose to do it, even though we can reasonably assume it wasn't tune accuracy, given there are plenty of elements with this vehicle that aren't tune accurate. Again, much like the vehicle mode, this isn't a bad figure. I'd say there's a lot more to like here in the robot modes, but there's still a lot of clumsiness to balance it out. Given the time this came out and how it's not trying to cram a whole other mode in, I ultimately can't give this as much leeway as the Power of the Primes one. Categorically, it is better in this mode, but I can't say it's more fun. And at this point, the Kingdom version kicks down the door and starts playing Sweet Victory because f*** me, this is a beautiful robot mode. Like, I hate to give away who wins each segment right off the bat, but come on, you look at these three and you can instantly tell who takes the cake. From an actual design perspective, it's a far simpler beast than the other two, but the mechanical detail that coats the damn thing is anything but. Like, you thought the SS86 calves were good? Check out these meaty clompers. There's so much greebling here, and it works ridiculously well. Moving further up, you might think these thighs would cause problems being entirely painted in a glossy finish, no less. But nope, not a single bit of paint chipping, so they get to look stunning and hold up flawlessly through endless transformations. That orange paint continues to the chest, and it does wonders in making it feel premium. And once again, the flames look absolutely gorgeous. Nice and simple upward arcs, none of that wispy or wobbly nonsense. Also happens to be the only one of the three with a completely centered Autobot symbol, although I suspect that's luck of the draw on my part. And look at that! Matrix cavity! Was that so hard? I will say, though, I do prefer the bronze of the SS86 one to the gold on this edition. Ah oh, well, since I own both, swapping out should be a piece of cake. Moving to the back, yes, he does have a bigger backpack. Perhaps the biggest of the three. Honestly though, who the hell cares? Because it's so big, it allows the transformation to be clean and concise, with no bits getting in the way of each other. And beyond that, the spoiler covers up everything here anyway. And my word, what a fantastic spoiler we have here. Its size almost creates a Studio Ox quality. Not quite as resplendent, but it's damn close. Moving on to the arms, remember how the butterfly joint flat out didn't work on the 86 one? Well, watch this. The chest has an extra joint that flips up specifically to allow the extra range of motion. Roddy hell, that's f insane attention to detail. And beyond that, the joints are all toleranced brilliantly, with wonderfully smooth universals and endless fun bicep swivels. He's even got inward wrist rotation to assist with extra matrix motion. And combined with the articulated fingers, which greatly outclass anything his predecessor had, they allow this guy to feel supernatural in any pose. In fact, on the whole, the articulation is excellent. You can really tell the design was concepted around the idea of fitting all these joints in. And yes, it definitely uses the SS86 mold as a blueprint, but f Hell, it goes way beyond anything that mold was ever capable of. It's very hard to find faults with this guy. I've seen people complain the hands are a little too large, and in photos they definitely appear that way, but in person it's far from annoying. In fact, there's only one gripe I have with this fella. Just one. The head sculpt f***ing sucks. I never knew it was possible to make it look like a Transformer had bags under his eyes, but hey, apparently here we are. This guy's seeing way too much shit being designed over the course of the 2020 apocalypse. It's also slightly too big. These days I've gotten used to it, but I feel it should have been slightly shorter, given the rest of the proportions. Now, usually an awful head sculpt would be a massive turn-off for the rest of the figure, but everything else here is fantastic. There's plenty of paint, a shit ton of sculpting, and everything you could ask for with the articulation, bar maybe an ab crunch, although given the complexity of the transformation, who gives a f***? The accessories he comes with are also pretty respectable. He doesn't come with a crazy amount, considering the rest of his commander price point goes to something we'll get to in due time, but what we do have here is alright. He comes with a sword, which is sadly more of an oversized knife. This thing really should have been bigger, especially at the price point, but eh, it's here and it works alright. The real star of the show is the rifle, which looks pretty f***ing sweet. Despite folding up for ease of storage, the sculpting remains crisp. It's one of the few times where I'm not compelled to go out and grab one of the non-edge replacements. For once, out of the box, it works quite well. Although, yeah, the Power of the Primes one is a little better, just slightly. Fun fact though, both of these store in the vehicle mode, with the sword slotting under and the gun chilling on the side. One works pretty well, the other does not. Either way, though, these do their job well enough. They could be better, but they function. Beyond that, you get another blast effect for the Matrix. One that's oddly different from the original one. I kind of prefer the original just because it looks more realistic, but for people who are only planning on getting one, it does the job. It's frustratingly made out of the same clear plastic as the windows were, so there's not much torque here. Not really a fan of that, it's just begging for the plastic to become brittle over time. That same plastic is used on these smoke sections, which plug into the arms and double up as dark energy blasts. I'm discussing them in this section specifically because I really like using them like like this. Using them for their intended purpose, uh, they look dumb. I probably would have preferred had they just left these in blue to begin with, as they're obviously on the same sprue as the Matrix Blast. And before you tell me that would look ridiculous, I've seen the same effect on Springer, and it looks f***ing sweet. And that leaves us with... 
Hmm, maybe we'll hold off on that for a second, because I want to focus on the main guy for a bit. Rodimus Prime is lovely. He's a fantastic figure at the leader size class that takes full advantage of his extended price point. This is another case where I don't think he could have been done as well at the regular $90. But hey, what do I know? I said the same thing about Earthrise Optimus Prime, and oh, look at that. What the fuck? There's so much paint, so many parts, so much articulation, it all comes together to form a near-perfect package. Sure, he does have the issue of the head sculpt, and I know many collectors who will skip him for that, but if you're buying this for the core robot and don't care about any of the extra accessories, then my word, you were in for a treat. Of course, there's one final segment to tackle. One that the Studio Series 86 version will sadly have to sit out of because he just doesn't have a dog in this race. It's now time to tackle the extra functionality because these two have whole other systems up their sleeves. But to tackle the first of the two, well, another transformation sequence is required. Jesus Christ. Five. Transformations in one video. And it's not even covering six. Shot. I swear when this video is done, I'm probably gonna collapse from exhaustion. The combination for Rodimus Prime is actually incredibly fun. Something that I noted when I first messed around with him at the Hasbro Power of the Primes event that I attended. Real shame they haven't done one of those since. Apparently they do all of their events in Melbourne and Queensland. A bit of a shame. I would say this is the best combination of the three, because the other two were trying to force an existing idea into a gimmick, whereas this Rodimus Prime combination was designed from the ground up. It's a unique combination, one that I haven't seen done anywhere else. It was done with real ingenuity. Now, of course, the first thing you want to do is make sure these hoses are all the way up so that we can disconnect everything. They probably won't still be in place if you've disconnected it from the combined mode, but just in case, make sure they're gone. That will allow you to take this whole section and undo it there. The arms will probably disconnect in the process, but if not, they're pegged together like so and they just come apart like that. Let's work on the first bit, the main bit first. So you want to bring these panels and plug them into the sides like so. Then you want to undo the feet, otherwise none of this is going to work properly. That will unlock everything and will allow you to bring the thighs down. Bring out the heel spurs, might as well do that now before we forget anything later. Undo these sections here. That will give you enough clearance to move this whole section down and then bring the hips up like that and bring the front skirt down like that. And then the back panels just clip back into each other now that the whole thing's out of there. And the legs separate like so. The kibble management's not the best here, but my word, what an elegant leg transformation. This is something you'd expect out of War for Cybertron here, not something out of the Gimped Prime Wars trilogy. Really done well. The arms work very simply. You've just got this panel here and they rotate like that. And of course you rotate the hands into place if you haven't rotated them already. Of course with the upgrade sets I've added in here with the posable fingers, ooh, I find it better to rotate the hands down so that when it clips up it just folds in a bit better. But I don't think the stock hands have that compatibility. Also just triple check that the smokestacks are facing down like that. And now for the meat and potatoes. The first thing you want to do is bring the head back into its vehicle mode configuration like so. The arms pop forward like like so, and they kind of seem like they're just sitting there, but trust me, it'll make sense later on. Clip the arms back into their vehicle mode configuration as well, and then you rotate this section up and also back into its vehicle mode configuration. But we're not going all the way there, oh no. What you want to do is bring the legs down, rotate them around 180 degrees, and the reason you're going to want to do that is because when this is facing forward, you want to have that extra bit of motion upwards to actually give the shoulders extra articulation. Yes, you do have the screws visible, and yes, the instructions do tell you to keep it around like that, but then you're trying to move the shoulders and they kind of get stuck, whereas this way you get way more. Anywho, you just want to bring the feet back into their vehicle mode configuration and then you use this extra joint that folds it up and locks it into place. No tabs or anything of the sort, it just kind of sits there. But hey, it functions, it does the job, everything works nice and solidly. Now, the moment of truth. You've got that big peg there and you've got a nice slot there and the whole thing slots there with the backpack slotting in like so and the whole thing pegging in like that. Just be warned when you do take the thing out, the backpack may come off. And also while we're at the back here, I just forgot we have to rotate that 180 degrees as well. Seems like a kind of pointless piece though, considering it doesn't do much. Now what you want to do is grab this whole section, it's going to untab from there and re-tab into the torso and the arms will lock into the back like so. So that's why we left the arms kind of sitting there on their own previously because they do become nice and solid later on. But right now there's no point of going after any Decepticons because he's armless, hardy ha ha. So what you want to do is just click the arms into place. They're actually quite easy to do but for some reason on camera I'm having a lot of trouble. But it's a really clever 
combination anyway it's not something you would have expected out of this and of course as you can see with the extra rotation you get all that rotation up there because the screws are visible at the front with the screws not visible at the front you just get that much it does it stops at that point so that's why i prefer to have these screws around the front like so i mean honestly who cares it's such a minor thing it's kind of like the whole galvatron debacle everyone's saying oh no visible pins when you rotate it around who gives a shit? who gives a shit? either way holy shit, what a unique combination what an interesting combination Combination. If you're into unique and interesting ideas in Transformers, well, this is right up your alley. I can't stress enough, this guy was not given enough credit when he first came out. Amongst the mediocrity in the shit filled Power of the Primes line, he was a shining star. No matter who you are, shining out to see who you can truly be. Point is, f me. Even today, this is some clever shit. Over the years, the community has latched onto Power of the Primes with incredible vitriol. It was a delayed reaction, as although I personally hated it from day one, many others took a while to get over their honeymoon phases. Seems to be a common theme, actually. I remember the days when everyone was going bananas over the Siege Netflix show. Good times, good times. Rodimus is one of these examples, with plenty of hate to go around. People hate the concept, people hate the design, people hate the very fact that this figure exists. But you know what? In spite of everything this line has done over its one-year run, this guy is pretty f***. Awesome. Now reeling it back for a bit, yes, he has his issues. The ankle rockers are pretty pathetic, not properly able to support the weight as he topples backwards. Not unable to be worked around, but still not great either. His backpack is pretty egregious. I never compared about backpack kibble personally, but I can see why a bunch of people would in this instance. The spoiler is pretty pathetic, reusing the same spoiler as the regular robot mode. The only faux part they incorporate basically does nothing, which is a bit of a letdown. And of course, who could forget the exposed thighs, creating something nearly as spindly as Smolder's combined mode. In in spite of all this though, honestly, this is a damn good package. Beyond all the flaws, the few things it does well, it does really well. The head sculpt continues to be done really well, just like the individual version. There's not really that much differentiation between Hot Rod and Rodimus as you combine the thing here. But hey, it's a great head sculpt, so who cares? That's not to say there are no differences though, because oh look, black legs just as they should be. And my word, these things are done really well. Not just in the visual department of course, given they have to compete with a chunk of the trailer, but just naturally in the poseability. It's the opposite of what was present in the regular robot mode, with the top half being compromised and the bottom half doing quite well. You've got lovely ankle rockers and tilts that allow this leader class edition to get into a surprising amount of poses. Sure, the shoulders have their issues given how this transforms, but not as much as you'd think. And when combined with the effortless legs, you can actually get some great poses. Hell, throw the gun into the mix, which as I said earlier is wonderfully sculpted, and you've got a figure that is a joy to photograph. Although I must confess, I did add Shockwave Lab hand upgrades to the mix. I do wonder if these upgrades are what inspired Hasbro to pursue hand articulation. They do keep an eye on third party after all. Then you've got the subtle things, like how the back of the car becomes the shoulder detail. Yes, you have to deal with the stupid stickers again, but looks-wise, they've done a bang-up job. I also love how they've incorporated the smokestacks into the arms. It's a really clever way of doing things, and despite being a heavy deviation from the source material, I like that they make a statement instead of folding away into obscurity. Wait, that's not how that word works. Anyway, anywho, anyhow, they even managed to work in a Matrix gimmick, although I guess I shouldn't be surprised given the line he was in. Even Predaking had a Matrix for f**k's sake. My point is, though, this figure isn't the cleanest, but out of the three, I honestly think he brings the fun factor the most. Is he perfect? F no. But all of his sacrifices work towards the whole. Every shortcoming is so that there's enough visual interest in the other modes. Every clunky engineering element is there so that others can function to their highest potential. It's not like Double Dealer, where the compromises lead to nothing. There are clear ideas at play here, and it f***ing works. I wish I could say the same for Kingdom Rodimus' trailer, because... Uh, there are no ideas whatsoever. But hang on, before we move on, I just realised I didn't include a part in the script where I discuss how big he is. So, here are the dimensions of the sizes and all that jazz. My apologies for forgetting it, so... Let's keep going. The trailer is just a box. Now at face value and to those entrenched in love for the G1 original, this might seem perfectly adequate. It does exactly what the G1 toy does. From an engineering and a value for money perspective, things get a little more complicated. To examine this, let's see what it can do and what it is. The trailer opens up to reveal the turret and a shit ton of 5mm ports. It's somewhat reminiscent of the old Dark of the Moon trailer. No, not that one. No, not that one either. There we go! I'm sure someone out there will get a kick out of this, even if it isn't specifically for me. The turret unpegs, and it's surprisingly well balanced. I was fully expecting this thing to topple over, but hey, it remains in place. The top section also opens up to reveal the most minuscule compartments you could imagine. I guess you could put a MicroMaster in there, or maybe the guns since it doesn't fit in the tray below, which we'll get to soon. But even so, this feels like it was shoehorned in. The back also opens up with the 
wonderful addition of faux pistons. You've even got what's either chrome or actual pins holding it in place. Honestly, I can't tell, which means either they went the extra mile to include metal pins, or they went the extra mile to make the chrome durable as f The back folds up with a connection port for the Earth Rise system with a name so stupid I dare not utter it out loud. And you even get a storage tray under the trailer to fit all the extra doodads, taken straight from the 44th Masterpiece release. This actually does a great job of keeping most of your accessories in one place. Well, aside from the extra blast effects. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, he comes with Omega Spreen's blast effects. Again! Can we get some new blast effects on the bigger guys yet? Thank you! But yes, overall, what it does is pretty neat, but does it do enough? Let's break down the price for a bit. Rodimus is beyond a $90 figure. I'd easily put him 10 bucks above, given his parts count and paint. However, that still leaves 50 bucks for the trailer and accessories. And honestly, I don't think it's worth that. It's close in the plastic quantity, but in the play value department, definitely not. Had they done more with the turret, maybe given it more transformation elements? Perhaps I could have considered this a proper package. Or maybe had they included some more accessories, I could have let it slide. But they they didn't. It feels like it's not quite worth the commander price of admission. Definitely close, but sadly no cigar. And hey, a $50 trailer should at least stay together. Oh yeah, at random points the trailer just decides it's not going to stay locked in. Nobody knows why, and it affects pretty much every copy I've seen online, so there's that I guess. Even putting play value aside, issues like that and the massive gap in the pipes make this thing feel like an afterthought. They put so much effort into Rodimus Prime, and then you get to this and it just doesn't feel like it's up to the same standard. Is it bad? No, definitely not. But I honestly expect better after the absolute bangers we got with Jetfire and Skylinks. They kept pushing what was possible with the size class, and Rodimus is indicative of that. On his own, he easily outclasses the other two with his engineering, making me incredibly hyped for the eventual Motormaster. But with the trailer, not so much. I have heard rumours that the other two were priced with a lower profit margin, and as such they're technically worth more than the 150 Aussie dollar do asking price. But I haven't been able to verify that rumour, and given the limited quantities of Commander class figures, I somewhat doubt that claim. Either way, a precedent has been set, and thanks to the trailer, this release hasn't quite made it. Maybe had it sprawled out into a place set, it could have met that precedent. But then it wouldn't have been G1 accurate, except this is War for Cybertron, where you get some more leeway. Ah oh well, we have what we have, it functions but it doesn't inspire, that's all I can really say. So ultimately that calls into question, which overall is the best of the three? Well, let's get what I consider to be the black sheep out of the way first. Studio Series 86 Hot Rod, at least to me, feels like a swing and a miss. It tries to do something that may not even be possible at the Voyager price point. Perhaps if it were given the leader treatment, it could have achieved perfect accuracy, and still been a fun toy, but as it stands, I see it as neither. It's not bad at all, but it's definitely compromised in many ways, leading to, at least in how I see it, a mediocre experience. But apparently I'm the only one who feels this way, and everyone else loves this one to bits, just like Jazz. So what do I know? Either way, if you're infatuated with the way this looks, sure, fine, go for it. Just temper your expectations going in, otherwise you may end up with the urge to sell it off pretty quickly. In fact, now that I own Rodimus, and after going through this review, I'm actually tempted to do so myself. Don't ask, I'll decide when I'm ready. As for the other two, well, they both have their issues. One of them makes small sacrifices along the way to get the whole package to work, whilst the other has a truly amazing core yet fumbles with its add-ons. It's close, real close, but in the end, I think that although they both reach the same overall score, the Kingdom version edges out ever so slightly. Yes, it's a 4 out of 5, much like the Power of the Primes version, but breaking that down, it's a mediocre 3 out of 5 trailer and a creme de la creme 5 out of 5 base leader and a 10th. In spite of all I've said, that core robot really does carry the sets. No pun intended. And hey, even though the box may not be worth 150 at the time of writing, and most likely at the time of posting, no. both Amazon and Big W are selling it at 109 Aussie dollary dues. That to me seems like a steal of a deal, so it's best to hop on quickly. And maybe later down the line, give the Power of the Primes edition a shot. Honestly, it hasn't aged as poorly as many people have believed it to. Three and a half pretty damn good modes is pretty good value for money. And there's lots to love here regardless. Maybe if you don't like to double up on characters, there's always the Shattered Glass variants that you can get. Oh, sorry, Rodimus Unicronus. Yeah, sure, totally something different. You're not fooling anyone, you know. This thing sold like shits, leading to them making the current Shattered Glass line online only. But as a result, you can find copies on the cheap all over the place. And let's be real, who doesn't love a good deal? Still not a good idea to go all in on the Power of the Primes line, but hey, a lot of fun to be had here. All I can say is that when newer versions come out, they may not necessarily devalue what has come before. I'm not even talking about replacing figures, sometimes versions can coexist within collections. People have constantly talked about swapping Evolution Rodimus out for one of the newer ones, and honestly, I don't think that's really fair. Sure, it's fun to compare and contrast, but each offers something incredibly different. I'm glad to have both of these. Both offer something unique, and neither takes away from each other. And I wouldn't change that for the world. Yeah, and I might sell off the SS86 one, because WHY THE F*** ISN'T HE PINK?! Ah!